Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to our SF City event today. This is my favorite part of doing these virtual events where I pretend like I'm seeing everybody filing into the room for an amazing event today. Um, but virtually, I really appreciate everyone joining us um, and taking the time on their lunch hour to talk about a very important topic, and that is bridging the digital divide. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers for you today, uh, starting with myself, Jen Stoikovic, um, the Executive Director of SF City, and then we will be bringing in a number of fantastic uh, panelists in a moment. Before we get to that, my job as your host is to go through some housekeeping notes. Uh, I know this can take a little bit, so I'll keep it as short and sweet as possible. First off, today's conversation is going to be recorded. So if you miss an amazing nugget of information or you really want to do a rewatch and wonk out about all things digital divide, we will be sharing this conversation out afterwards. Next up, we have a Q&A section today. So you'll see down there, there we go, over there, the Q&A tab. So I assume most of you know how Zoom works by now, but if not, please make sure to put your question into that Q&A tab below as we go through today's conversation. We have quite a bit of moderated questions, but then we will get to as many audience questions as we can. So as a reminder, Q&A tab for all of your questions. All right, next. We would love for you to be sharing out your thoughts on social media. So if you would like to share any of your thoughts about today's conversation, you'll see right there in the chat, Zach from the SF City team dropped it in. You can tag SF City on Twitter at SF City and use the hashtag, hashtag bridging the divide. It's a little bit of a long one, but we appreciate everybody sharing their thoughts on there. Lastly, before I bring up our esteemed panelists, thank you so much to Verizon and AT&T for making today's conversation possible. It is a conversation that is near and dear to many of our hearts. It's something that is very, very paramount to San Francisco coming out of the recovery for communi community members of all over. So we wanna make sure that um, everybody here takes a look at some of the work that Verizon at and is doing after today's conversation to work on bridging the digital divide. All right, I think we're ready. We're ready to bring everybody up. Okay, esteemed panelists, let's all virtually walk on stage. Welcome up. Hello, hello, hello. All right, I got everybody. How is everybody? Great. Awesome. Yeah, we got supervisor, we got you. Uh, so welcome to the stage. We've got a huge group of leaders here uh, all across the spectrum that are working in this very important area of focus. Uh, I love when people actually get a chance to introduce themselves rather than someone reading your bio out for you. So I'm gonna go around the room real quick and let everyone uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about how they're working on this issue. So we'll start with you, Cami Griffiths. Welcome to the stage. Thanks so much. This is an awesome panel. Thanks for having me. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Community Tech Network. We're a nonprofit based in San Francisco, and we provide digital literacy training in low-income communities. Our focus had been entirely digital literacy prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic proved that we needed to do more to get devices and help people sign up for internet. So we launched a really awesome program. I learned a ton and happy to share more today. So thanks for having me. Fabulous. Rudy? Hi, Jennifer. Rudy Reyes uh, with Verizon. I lead all of our state legal, regulatory, government affairs, and community engagement work in the Western United States, most importantly, California. And uh, this issue of the digital divide is foundational to the work that we've been doing. What a year of broadband, another hashtag year of broadband that, we are, that we're having. So uh, really looking forward to talking about this issue today. And Manny. Hello, I'm uh, Manny Kutiel. I'm in my small business right now. So if you hear some Lucy, Do Lucy Dacus in the background, some folk music, that's because the cafe behind me is currently serving drinks. Um, I'm a small business owner. I'm on the board of the Valencia Corridor Merchants Association and was on the Small Business Commission and I'm now on the SFMTA board. 
and an avid internet user and feel lucky to be able to. <laughs> I've got a great ISP here at Manny's um, and just, you know, excited to be here. Thanks for including me. <laughs> Are we all avid internet users? <laughs> I, don't think I, guess we'll, I guess we'll find out at the end of this panel. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think our last year and a half would have existed for anybody if we weren't. Did Okay, just real quick show of hands. Did anybody go from never using Zoom to just like a complete like Zoom aficionado? Yeah, or, or Teams, sorry, supervisor, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, and last but not least, um, Supervisor Haney, welcome. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, SF City, and to all of my fellow panelists. Uh, it's really great to be a part of this panel. I, I, uh, I am also an avid uh, internet user, uh, and I, I, I think I definitely tweeted a lot more during the pandemic than I did before, so I relied a lot on, on the internet myself. Uh, I am the supervisor of District 6. I represent the Tenderloin, Civic Center, Mid-Market, Rincon Hill, South Beach, Mission Bay, and Treasure Island. Uh, and it's obviously a place where we have a lot of technology and technology companies. Uh, we also have a lot of disparities on um, the Tre Treasure Island and the Tenderloin, in particular two areas where uh, there is a huge need as it relates to uh, digital equity. Uh, before I was, I'm also the chair of the budget committee and uh, we focused a lot on this issue during the budget process. And lastly, before I was uh, supervisor, I spent six years on the Board of Education in San Francisco, and I authored a number of digital equity related policies, including uh, our computer science uh, sequenced K through 12 education uh, at, at uh, SFUSD. So uh, worked on it a lot from that capacity too, and looking forward to the conversation. All right, so we really truly have a broad spectrum of voices when it comes to this conversation today. So. I'm excited to dive deep and get into it. Uh, so perhaps, Rudy, we could start with you. I'd love to hear, and, and let's set kind of the tone for the audience, what did it look like prior to the pandemic um, in terms of, of the digital divide? And just explain a little bit for the audience uh, what the state of affairs was and how the pandemic has affected it. Sure, Jennifer, thanks very much for the question. And, and again, for, uh, for allowing me to speak here, it's a great honor. Um, so I think setting definitions, what we're talking about is, is really important. What is the digital divide? So I think, and how does it look, you know, before the pandemic to after, you know, the digital divide, I think Verizon, and I think about it in terms of a three-legged stool, right? You have to have access to the internet, which is the, the network infrastructure that is built to make the internet uh, accessible to everyone. You have to have affordability of uh, internet service so that our lower income consumers, especially during the pandemic, are able to afford to connect to this vital service. And then the third leg of the stool is adoption. You have to get regular consumers and small business owners understanding the value and the essential nature of broadband so that they adopt it, they, they uh, take it. Uh, and if you don't uh, address this issue of the digital divide, all three legs of the stool, you're going to miss the issue. So to really move the mark to get, uh, you know, we try to go for universal connection, right? Universal access. Uh, you're never going to get 100%. There are very remote parts of the state uh, that are very challenging. You know, the governor is right now having a press conference on $6 billion dollars that he is uh, and the legislature have agreed to spend to expand broadband access in these hardest to reach areas of the state, but also our urban deserts. If you don't address the affordability aspect, like um, uh, with the emergency broadband benefit that the FCC and Congress enacted during uh, the coronavirus, uh, and then trying to make something like that permanent or this adoption layer, you're not really moving the needle. And to answer your question very uh, directly, I think pre-pandemic, the digital divide was there. I mean, we've been wrestling. I've been working in this industry for almost uh, 20 years. And how we get internet service, the network built and the service out in a uh, universal way has been the quintessential problem in telecommunications for a generation. It's the foundation of the 1996, you know, under President Bill Clinton Telecommunications Act was how do we get this 
out there. So I see 2020 and 2021 as the high watermark of this, where we're actually able, due to technological advances in wireless, getting fiber built, micro trenching, and other things, where we're able to really get this network uh, built for so many more consumers. So I'm looking forward to div di uh, diving deeper into this discussion as we get going. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. I, I think it would be great to turn to some other folks that, to see what their experience has been on the ground. Uh, perhaps Supervisor Haney, we can hear from you first about from a legislative perspective and, and what you've been hearing from your constituents and also with your time on the Board of Ed before, uh, what does it look like for you both before and after the pandemic? Thank you for, for the question. And, um, and, you know, I think that the pandemic really in, in many ways exacerbated some of the challenges that were already there uh, and uh, put an emphasis on uh, access from a digital perspective. Um, we knew, knew that there were many of the places that people used to access either the internet like the libraries uh, or services like drop-in centers and uh, city hall itself was, was shut down. And for that reason, uh, I think for, for our city, it was really a, a moment of reckoning uh, to, uh, to acknowledge that there are life or death com um, um, consequences when people don't have full access uh, to the internet or the digital skills to access um, what they need to survive. And so that, that, that I think has led to a lot more urgency, thankfully, overdue urgency at the city uh, and county around closing the, the digital divide. We still have over 100,000 San Franciscans that either lack broadband internet service at home or basic digital skills. Um, this is even more acute uh, among seniors, among limited uh, English speaking populations. And we see this, and I've seen this in uh, in our SROs uh, here in the Tenderloin. I've seen it in, in, on Treasure Island where we have particular questions and challenges around access. And, uh, and I'm sure we will have the opportunity to get into this a bit more, but the city now has a digital equity strategic plan that really focuses on very similar pillars actually to, to what Rudy just laid, laid out, uh, expanding affordable high quality internet access, a high quality computer access, and then digital literacy and skill development and making sure that we are pursuing each of these individual uh, um, uh, pillars. I will just say lastly that during the pandemic, um, we also really focused a lot of our energy in ensuring that there was uh, high-speed internet access in places like homeless shelters, in uh, shelter-in-place hotels, um, in public housing. Um, and it's been a big priority to make sure that in some of these city controlled uh, or leased facilities that at least we're starting there in our affordable housing units. We have a program called Fiber to Housing uh, that, 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 that has been a big priority for the city. So even just in a city as technologically advanced as ours, um, we are still at that point where we're focused a lot on our own units and our own facilities and making sure that they're up, uh, but, but knowing that the need uh, is much bigger and the, and the focus that uh, the pandemic brought us in terms of access uh, should be uh, to uh, definitely added a lot of urgency moving forward. Thanks for that. So going to Cami, I know that you have obviously done a lot on the ground as a nonprofit that has been focused on this far before the pandemic. What does that response look like for you? And I'd love for you to play a little bit more into what equity means from your perspective. Absolutely. So Rudy talked about adoption, which really talks about, do they have a device? Do they know how to use that device? Do they understand the relevancy? So adoption is a big bucket. And what we're seeing is that people are lacking the access. Um, they don't necessarily want it. So some people are needing to be convinced that they, this is something important to them, especially older adults who might feel insecure about their ability to use the internet. They might think they're too old to learn or that they're going to break it. So this is an audience that we've been helping. The majority of our time has been spent helping those individuals through partnerships with senior centers, uh, through funding from uh, the Department of Disability and Aging Services, a program called SF Connected that we've been working with since 2010. In 
in uh, physical locations. And then COVID allowed us the time to launch this program called Home Connect. And that's where we're identifying individuals who need the training, the device, the internet, the training, and we're taking referrals from our partners. We're providing them a tablet. We ship them or hand deliver a tablet with a booklet and we provide remote training in five different languages. And we've really been able to do an incredible job. To date, we've helped, uh, we we provided more than 300 devices, or actually the number of devices, 413 devices have been shipped out to San Franciscoans, older adults, and uh, nearly 400 of them have completed our, our training program. And this is just something we launched after the, after the pandemic started. Like Jennifer said, we've been doing this work since 2008 when we started, and back then it was like they could just go to the library, they could just go to their community center. But you still need to learn how to use it. You still need someone to train you on how to use it. And these big, huge group classes that you might've enrolled in at City College is really intimidating for some folks. So to understand there are some learners out there that need a little different kind of training. They need a little more handholding, they need a little more empathy in their situation. So that's been our sweet spot. And what we're seeing is that as we help more of those people, it's harder to reach the others that we have been helping. As far as equity, we really try to focus on the partners in the communities that need the most help. So reaching to our partners in the Bayview into the Tenderloin Western Edition and really working with them and through them to connect with their residents, their clients, their patrons, you know, whatever, however we describe them, there are just tens of thousands of people who might have a phone, but not know how to use it. Might have the internet, but might not have a device and they don't know how to use it. So how do we help bridge all those gaps and not just the internet, but the skills and, and, and even the relevancy of why would I spend my time on this? So it's really great that we're talking about this, that we can uh, get the word out to other leaders in this area that it's not just about the internet, but about devices and about their literacy. Absolutely. So Manny, I think that your perspective here is very interesting because of all the small business owners in San Francisco, your pivot to, to virtual and, and the digital world seemed to be one of the highlights of, of the pandemic. But I'm curious from a small business perspective, have you seen other small business owners be able to, to bridge that as easily? And, and what are some of the difficulties that you've seen um, in terms of the digital divide from a, from a business owner perspective? Thanks for the question. Uh, no, I think uh, not every small business was well positioned to move to digital. Um, part of doing programming online, it's kind of a volume play. So if you had a lot of people already in the mix, if you had a large mailing list, it was a little bit easier um, to get lots of folks on online events. But for the venues and the small businesses that maybe had a smaller core group of lovers and supporters, uh, or just hadn't had a lot of uh, facility with moving things online, it was a lot tougher. Um, and so it was not seamless for everyone. And certainly the businesses that um, were not doing events, but were uh, selling wares, whether it's retail, food or beverage, um, you know, moving to online stores or, you know, moving to delivery and takeout, you know, not everyone um, has the same experience with utilizing these tools. And so um, there were winners and losers, and it definitely exposed um, how liter digital literacy is core to a small business's survival. I think the biggest issue for a small business right now is a lack of choice with the number of ISPs. Um, there really are only a few out there. And because of that severe lack of choice, we're kind of at the whim of whatever our building is wired for. And I think that's to the detriment of uh, everyone, uh, the small businesses, especially because if you can't choose from a number of different options for your ISP, you are kind of stuck. And so I would love to see as we think about, I think, Rudy, you called it a high, high watermark. And I think the governor's, uh, you know, now press conference and the bill that's being passed through the California state legislature about funding, uh, closing this digital divide. Uh, what's exciting to me is maybe this is finally the time where we can talk about a municipal fiber network, where we do not have to be at the whim of the ISPs to decide what, what my small business chooses to bring its internet provider, but actually the city or the agencies or the department can own the fiber themselves, and you can choose from a number of different ISPs. I think small business owners would love more choice uh, because it's more consistent, it would stabilize prices, and frankly, like as a small business owner, we like to shop around. We like to choose different vendors. We like to, you know, figure out who, who we want our coffee vendor to be or our uh, seltzer water vendor. And it's kind of tough 
uh, when you get into a lease, you're kind of stuck with whatever ISP the building has. So we'd love to see that change. And from a small business pers perspective, that would be ideal. So as everybody can see, the current situation that we are in affects everyone so differently, but there is these unique common threads that we have some very serious challenges in San Francisco. And it's very odd that the tech capital of the world, you know, we basically got a stable of unicorns in this, in this little city. We are still struggling with this. And, and I, I think what I'd love to transition to now in the conversation as, as we've established all the different groups um, that are working on it is what are solutions? What is it that we can be doing to move us forward? And, and how is this such a huge part of the recovery? Uh, so perhaps Rudy, um, we could go to you to start. So what are some of the solutions? And, and perhaps now we drop the, the 5G bomb into the conversation and, and how is, is 5G related to those solutions? So uh, thank you, Jennifer. And I wanted to pick up on what Manny said because I think the solution has to be a all of the above solution that um, uh, where uh, we work in partnership. So it, it really, this issue solving it and all three legs of the stool is gonna take a close partnership between industry and government and for us to lift up all of the solutions. Like there are some um, activists who try to, uh, you know, point to like, you know, fiber is the only solution or we must do this or we must do that. You know, Manny referred to public ISPs. I think, you know, at Verizon, uh, we're all about lifting up all of these solutions uh, because no one player in this ecosystem is going to be able to solve 100% of the problem. So it's not just fiber, it's wireless, right? It's not just public uh, uh, players, but the private industry. And I mentioned that, that we're poised at this high watermark to actually, and I'll make a, a bold statement, solve the digital divide in large part for many, many more people in our state, in our country. Uh, wireless technology now, you know, we have 4G, which was invented about 10 years ago. And that really revolutionized uh, the way we work and play. We can stream on the go now. But with 5G, the technology is that the, the, the pipe that is going to serve consumers wirelessly is like a fiber pipe. It is big. It's gigabit level connectivity. And there are no data caps, right? So in 4G, you have to manage the network because there's a finite amount of resources and you need to make sure that everyone has a good experience, especially during emergencies. With 5G, you don't have data caps. So for the first time, you have the incumbents that Manny was talking about, like the wireline incumbents, the telephone uh, company, the cable company. Now you have the wireless companies being able, able to provide fixed wireless service. So that service to your home or your small business versus mobile, right? We're all used to wireless mobile. That third option is gonna be a game changer for uh, for broadband access, especially with the uh, mid-band spectrum that the FCC just auctioned this year, in addition to the high band and the low band spectrum, again, all of the above, you're going to have this big pipe for high-speed, reliable broadband that is a new option. It's going to transform the options for Manny and other small businesses and for our consumers. And I just have to say, man, he's 100% right about the, we call them MDUs or multi-dwelling units. Sometimes the landlord makes a decision and you're locked in, your only choice is cable or your only choice is, you know, the incumbent telephone company. Really, you, you need to break down those barriers so that, uh, so that everyone can have multiple choices. And then the local reform aspect, you know, with all due respect to supervisor, uh, Haney, who's a reformer, I, I would be bold as to call him a reformer on the board. We desperately need reform at the local level to clear out a lot of the red tape, a lot of the high costs, and just, you know, inertia that, uh, that is at City Hall that does prevent us from being able to get, you know, permits approved, to get agreements made so that we can build this network all of the above. 
So uh, we, you know, have worked in partnership with so many cities across the country, many, many in California, uh, love to do that in San Francisco, and we're working with the state. So I, I really think this is a, a call for partnership. Uh, and we have a moment with technology uh, where it is to actually solve this problem in large part. I think maybe this is the best conversation that I've heard about why is 5G important? I don't think I've heard anyone actually explain it as, as thoughtfully as, as you did about why it's so different than 4G. Uh, and I think the opportunity that you pointed out is huge. Uh, supervisor, what are some of the challenges you're seeing on the ground of how do we deploy this 5G? Like, what can we be doing at a local level? Well, I think that, that, that Rudy uh, spoke to it. I mean, I think that uh, really viewing this as something that is essential for us to move towards uh, and, and really breaking down the barriers that are in the way right now uh, that can prevent that. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that um, city governments, not only on this, but on a lot of things, um, can sometimes fail to make the investments in the future, um, can make it can make partnership more difficult than it should be. And I think reassessing all of that from a city level is critical for us to be able to move forward. We're doing it, um, you know, I mean, there, 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 are, there are things that were in place for many decades that may have prevented adequate and effective partnership. Uh, and it may have come from a good place when it was there, but it may, it may now be getting in the way of our, our progress. And there, there are a lot of examples of that, um, you know, we need to be in, encouraging and incentivizing and partnering around investments in our infrastructure in a way that everybody can benefit from. Um, so I, you know, I'd like to see our city do that, you know, and, and, and do that in a way, of course, that addresses these equity issues that really focuses on the areas of our city where people are being left behind in terms of where the investment should be. Um, and I know uh, Rudy and I and others have, have, have spoken about that. Um, so, um, you know, it's conversations like these, it's a, it's a digital equity plan. Uh, it's really identifying where the needs are and then it's getting those barriers out of the way. Absolutely. So just a reminder to folks, uh, I see some great questions that are popping in. So we'll get to those shortly. Please drop them in that Q and A tab as you have them throughout today's conversation. So Cami and, and Manny, I'm going to turn to to you both in terms of this conversation, perhaps we'll start with you, Cami. What do you think is the number one uh, thing that folks that are joining today could take away from this and go make a difference in, in bridging this divide, whether it's advocating for 5G, whether it's volunteering, what would you recommend folks do? Right, so if they're at a nonprofit and they're working directly with someone who might not be connected, understand what they can do personally to help them get connected. There are low cost internet options out there. Comcast Internet Essentials is one of them. It's $10 a month. It's fairly easy to sign up for. Uh, Rudy mentioned the emergency broadband benefit that currently has a finite amount of money, but we're hoping that they'll be refunded, but that's essentially a subsidy of $50 a month for internet. If you are able to take in donations of devices and redistribute those to your community or acquire money to purchase devices for your community, be sure to do that and recognize that not everybody can afford to pay for the internet or afford a device. And then the literacy piece, there's ways to be trained as a trainer to offer this programming yourself as a nonprofit, uh, partnering with CTN to do something like that, engaging volunteers, tons of people in San Francisco want to give their time. And some of that can be given online virtually. So we engage volunteers as digital coaches and they're working online uh, with our learners. So that's a nonprofit space. And then for corporations, if you promote volunteerism to your employees and don't penalize them for volunteering and make it a thing that's really great and encouraging them to give their time to help out. That's one way. Of course, we would love to take a really huge tablet donation from Lenovo or any 10 inch tablet uh, manufacturer because we need those devices. Um, and then for policymakers, can we prioritize and we're seeing it happen and it's amazing money that gets funneled towards digital equity devices, internet and training. And then this kind of awareness raising, like I mentioned earlier, there are people that aren't quite sure that the internet's for them. And I think it's because they're scared 
scared because they think their identity is going to be stolen, that they're going to somehow lose money or that they're just afraid that they can't do it. And there's other barriers. So what can we do to make sure that they understand the Internet is for everybody and that you can benefit from being online? And lastly, I'll say, let's think about when we're taking something offline and putting it online, that not everyone's going to follow you, right? Like if you're putting housing applications like Dahlia is a great example that they created this wonderful platform called Dahlia where they created a platform where you could apply once, put your information in once and apply for all sorts of housing. Awesome, much better than handwriting paper, which is kind of what was happening. But not everybody knows how to use their phone to upload files and they don't understand all of this. So having training that goes along with the transition to online is absolutely essential if you really wanna help people who are on the other side of the divide. All right, well, that was extremely comprehensive, as I expected from you, Kimmy, because you truly, you know, you have your hands in so many different aspects of this conversation, both locally and federally across so many constituencies. Uh, in terms of business, all right, Manny, where do you see some solutions for folks that are on here today? What do you think they can do to help businesses get connected? Is it just like show people how to use a Facebook page or? Are there any really um, novel things that you've seen over the pandemic that has helped more business owners get connected? Not really, okay. to be fair. honest. I mean, Manny's, our internet costs about $300 a month, something like that, something usually sometimes more. Um, and like if you're if the question is how can you help your business get more connected local small business get more connected i mean like it sounds kind of silly but like first like spend all your money at san francisco small businesses and like pump them full of cash because with the cost of internet in this town that's probably one of the best ways to actually help them because we're kind of you know like i said we're at the mercy of whatever our building has been wired for unless you can get fiber wired to your building so first of all for anyone that's listening like it sounds like a no-brainer but our small business, the overhead in San Francisco is very high for a small business. And it's, it's, it's everything. It's, it's, it's labor, it's rent, but it is also, you know, PG&E. Our PG&E bill is $1,500 a month. Our ecology is $1,000 a month. And internet's a lot. So it's expensive out there, no matter how you slice it. And so support your small businesses. I guess for policymakers, one interesting idea is, you know, I think the city has like 250 miles of fiber tube. Um, and in some cases, we're able to lease it out to large institutions. And I know that like the city leases out fiber to UCSF and makes 300K a year or something like that. And so could we be leasing out our fiber cables to more large institutions? Should the SFMTA, does the SFMTA have the ability to do that? I don't know. Uh, maybe Matt, you, you and I can all work together to, to find a way to get more money for you to spend on the budget committee. Um, you know, by leasing out our fiber tubes to people. And then I, it's kind of tough. The reason why I say the answer is I don't know, because it seems very high level, right? How does the average person help address uh, such a massive thing like the digital divide? Um, I think staying informed is probably a big one. It's one of those have or have nots, right? Like if you have really good internet and you're not thinking about it, you probably don't realize that there are about 100,000 San Franciscans that do not have reliable uh, internet in their homes or in their places of, of work. So um, first, we all just need to realize that this is a big issue in our town, in our very own backyard. Uh, so let's start with that. Let's start from realizing this is a real thing. Um, and other than that, it's, it's a toughie. I'm, I'm not so sure. I'd love to add something. Matt mentioned earlier fiber to housing, and this has been a really great program the challenge of my work, we can't train people on how to use the internet if they don't have the internet and if they can't afford to pay for it. And so this fiber to housing project that's been managed by the Department of Technology is great because it's using some city fiber to connect low income housing developments and make that internet available for free up to a certain amount of time. I'm not sure what the duration is. And sometimes it's wired directly to units and sometimes it's a wireless network. So it makes my job a heck of a lot easier if the internet's already there and all I need to do is ship the tablet and start the training. So that's a program that should be replicated in other places where all low income housing developments have access to this type of infrastructure. Supervisor, what do you think? Can we start the, the internet leasing? What do you, what of, of any of these solutions do you see viable from a government perspective? Can 
Can you hear us, Supervisor? Yes. Um, <clears throat> you said, what are, what are some of the things that are viable from a government perspective? Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, that we do have the fiber to housing project, which, you know, we have been able to uh, expand access you know, to thousands of additional uh, housing units. We still have 32,000 affordable housing units that uh, need to be connected to, to high speed internet. And a lot of this is not only about what the internet is, but that its level of speed and capacity. And so I do think you know, closing that gap and really taking responsibility uh, for the housing units that we have access to is huge. I think that the city could do a better job as it relates to the facilitation of access to devices. Um, and this is part of our digital equity plan as well. Um, Sometimes companies have huge numbers of refurbished devices, uh, being able to connect the devices that uh, could be made available to people who are in need is something that I think that the city can play a much uh, 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 more robust uh, role with. Um, and then, you know, I think that we have learned a lot about the way that people access uh, information and services, uh, you know, in, in city government, I think everything needs to be done through a, a process of human centered design and, and really redesigning all of our services for access and making it easier and streamlined and, you know, uh, a, a single hubs, all of those things so that even if people uh, uh, are sort of are have have a have a set of digital skills that are still growing and being developed, that they don't find themselves lost in the morass of, uh, of access. I think there are a lot of things that San Francisco um, can do better to make things work, work easier and make access uh, more effective and, bro and broadening it just within what we have now and what people have access to themselves, mm -hmm. but that's improving our systems. And so I think that's something that the city can also do. And so with, through our, you know, Office of Technology and Civic in Innovation and uh, the, the work that we're doing to really uh, analyze and rethink all of the services and how people are able to access them with what they have. Absolutely. Rudy, what do you think in terms of folks that are also avid internet users and they want everybody else to be able to, to kind of make that leap as well? What are some things that folks that are listening today could do uh, tomorrow in their daily lives? Well, I just, you know, I want to double down on what, you know, Manny, Cami, and the supervisor all, all said. You know, I think that in large part, having more options for consumers and small business competition will solve 85% of the problem, real competition. And so, you know, this is not just a matter of a cold corporate business case. You know, th think of building a broadband network as a very costly, complex engineering project, right? Why wireless is not magic, right? It, it requires, you know, putting network facilities, capital investments, you know, infrastructure in the ground. And then that all needs to be connected to fiber. That's why I keep saying all of the above. It's not one or the other, it's both. It's a fiber wireless network. And, you know, there, there are um, left behind communities, right? You know, that, that we focus on um, uh, the Tenderloin um, uh, and other places. Uh, but there are also, you know, even wealthier areas of the city where, you know, half of our city is undergrounded, the utilities are undergrounded. So that means if you're going to do a wireless network, which cannot be undergrounded, the only place it could go is on the streetlight, right? And then that requires that streetlight then being connected to fiber underneath so that you have that fiber wireless network. I think, you know, how can we... Um, how can we build that? It's being built. And I think, and sometimes in San Francisco, we, we think about solving the problem like we have to, as a government, engineer and solve this massive problem. And really, I think government is a huge partner. And I think that if it does more streamlining and sculpting, working in partnership with the private industry, I think we can really uh, go a long way to solving the problem and then using our government resources, whether they be funding or programs to really target those uh, communities that, that, that where competition doesn't solve the problem. 
right? So, um, and, I, and I think uh, Manny talked about um, fiber, right? And, and uh, for example, you know, while we're building 5G, we want to blanket San Francisco with 5G so that people can have that third pipe for home and small business broadband. We have to lay fiber everywhere, right? And so uh, one way a city can work with us is, you know, instead of um, viewing that as an opportunity to tax and regulate the provider, right, which adds costs and burdens on the deployment of this essential infrastructure, what about a partnership opportunity where we're laying fiber, you can put conduit in there, just empty conduit, shadow conduit, right? That can be used for generations to come, right? So that can, that, that can be used in partnership with the city or other providers. There are simple things that can be done that are low cost now, but that will provide great value to the, to the city and to others uh, for generations. So start with you, Rudy, but who's doing this well? I, I think the most important thing for, for us here is who can we look at maybe an American city or outside of the US that has successfully done this and how could we bring it um, to San Francisco? So we'll start with you, Rudy. Well, I, I never like trashing my hometown of San Francisco. So I, I'm, I'm still optimistic that uh, with folks like Supervisor Haney and others that we'll get this done, right? It's my, I have a personal interest and, and, and my job, right, is, is coming with the Wonder Twins. We're gonna get this done. Uh, but uh, I think that if you look at California, like what Governor uh, Newsom is doing with his uh, budget, the $6 billion, you know, in addition to cities, San Jose, I uh, have to give a shout out to Mayor Licardo in San Jose. During the pandemic, you know, we have a public-private partnership with San Jose, uh, as do other companies. But during the pandemic, uh, safely, they kept the construction going. Right. Whereas other cities just shut down while everyone's at home, like it was such a great opportunity to build. Right. And so I think San Jose is a great model. Long Beach uh, is a great model. Sacramento, first in the country, the nation to get 5G with the public private partnership. It's really about coming together as private industry and government. I like to say around a round table where we're sitting together where we marry up our assets and our challenges and see about how we can lift each other up rather than this you know, cold negotiation, which is how much can we extract from one another? If we're, if we're in the former, it'll go faster and we'll actually solve the problem for real people. The other is just delay, red tape and finger pointing. So we can get this done uh, and, and it's, and I'm so excited about it. All right, Manny, what's the most connected city you've been to? What's the most what? Connected city you've been to, who's doing it well? Oh my God, that is such a curveball question. We'll come back to you, Cammy. I feel like I can't, I don't really file away my cities in terms of how digitally connected they are. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I've also haven't really traveled very much in the last 15 months, but for some reason I'm thinking of Toronto. I don't know why. I just feel like Toronto is probably very well connected digitally. Is that, <laughs> am I right with that? I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know, Rudy. I just feel like it is. I don't know. I've made like a sixth sense that Toronto is super well digitally connected. Not us. I'm proud to say that, that Muni now has Wi-Fi underground. So go San Francisco MTA. Cool. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Do, do you, Matt, is there a city that you think of as like, I'm going to pass this baton right to you, Matt. Is there, what city is the most digitally connected that you think? <laughs> well, there was going to be that Google city near Toronto. That's why I'm thinking of Toronto because Google was going to build a smart city and didn't have a, a yeah. yeah. Matt, what do you think? I can't believe you tried to deflect that one to me. Uh, may, maybe Cammy knows a, has a better answer. <laughs> You can pass it to Cami. I, I, I do think um, I don't. I can't say a particular city in the U.S. because I agree. I haven't really um, sort of reflected in in my travels on 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 that particular issue. But I do think that there are a lot of places throughout the world, cities throughout the world, where you just sort of have an expectation that 
public spaces have 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 Wi-Fi access, uh, whether that's parks or um, train stations or on the bus or where, wherever it is, it's just always there and it's more omnipresent. And I think that's that was my experience. I did get a chance to go to um, some countries in Northern Europe and experience that. And so, um, you know, that's been a conversation here as well as something that we should have as, you know, it's not the whole thing, but it should be at the very least, you know, when you're on, when you're on a train or you're on, um, you know, for a while, even Caltrain didn't have um, access. I mean, these are things that really should be pretty straightforward I mean, when you're in public spaces. I will say though, before we pass the ball back to Cami, if that's what you, what you want to do, Jennifer, is I do know what it feels like to have the inverse problem. So when I visited Havana, um, when there was that period of openness during Obama, I had just fallen in love with this ballet dancer. And you know that part where you fall in love with someone where you're just like thinking about them all the time and you have like, you're like nauseous and you think you might like have a stomach bug, but actually you just like are obsessed with them. So I was in that period of time with this guy and I had this trip to Cuba and in Cuba, like you can't get on Wi-Fi anywhere. And he being a dancer didn't have a smartphone and so could only text me. And, and I would have to like find like, the like little corner of a public park in Havana where there's a Wi-Fi signal and there would be hundreds of people like crouching over their phones, trying to access like one week Wi-Fi signal, probably all to text their own lovers and try to like get in touch with people. And so it really hit me like how lucky we are just to even be having this conversation about 5G and, you know, having everyone have accessible, have access to high speed internet, because there are parts of the world and other countries where like no one has access to high speed internet and everyone's crouching over their phones in public parts just to get a signal to text their lovers. I don't know how I follow up on that, but I will talk about some folks that we're serving in rural Texas, that they're part of a program that uh, they have a T-Mobile uh, card in their tablets and that doesn't work. And so he has to go to his local church to get the internet there. And so even in our country, like there's pockets of places that there's, there's like the desert that was mentioned earlier. But I wanna make sure that folks know about the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. They have a, um, a thing they call trailblazers. So they're highlighting cities that are doing it really well. And it is more than just infrastructure. Of course, it's the inclusion, the devices, the training. And then also another agency called Next Century Cities. And they're highlighting best practices happening in, age, in uh, government agencies specifically for digital inclusion. So I would say, while I don't know the best connected cities, I mean, Chattanooga can, comes to mind because they're the first city I know of that deployed fiber. Um, but I kind of, that's where my knowledge ends. Um, but those are two really great agencies that folks should uh, check out. All right, y'all ready to get to a couple Q and A? Leaving out, okay, this conversation has gone all over the place. I think we've established that 5G is not scary. 5G is a good thing, okay? Uh, we've also established that bad internet in Cuba. <laughs> um, I would love to, I know Manny, you've got a hop, so I'd love to get to a couple of questions uh, for, for the rest of y'all that are able to stay on. So Matt, maybe this is a good one for you. What do you see is the largest impediment in getting people connected from the city's perspective? Um, I, I think the infrastructure is still a huge, huge issue. Um, having the actual, you know, uh, the fiber, the, the the high speed access. I mean, I think that is still a huge barrier. I'd say, I'd say it's a bigger barrier than uh, the devices themselves. Um, just, you know, flat out being connected, and that's where, you know, the the five G conversation comes in. It's a, where this sort of larger question of infrastructure comes in. Um, you know, I, I do think that um, I would add to that the the digital literacy and the digital skills, those are hugely important as well. And so, um, you know, once people do have access, how, how can they actually use that in an effective way? Um, you know, those are, those are, I think, the biggest things that, that come up as far as I see them. And I think where the, 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 the priority will be for, for our city moving forward. Rudy, what do you see as, as the biggest impediment? And then Cami? Yeah, so, um... Again, my hometown of San Francisco, uh, I talked about red tape. I, you know, I think that there are the best of intentions uh, in our city government, uh, but uh, sometimes it feels a little bit like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, 
the, the solution is right before us, uh, but we sometimes make it so complex and layer on so much um, extra unneeded uh, items that it, it really delays uh, getting the infrastructure built. So, I mean, very specifically in San Francisco, we still don't have an agreement uh, with the city to deploy 5G at scale uh, ubiquitously, right? We have a 4G era agreement signed in Super Bowl 50 uh, that does not scale. It's not, um, it doesn't scale for 5G to give that ubiquitous coverage. I mean, I'm thinking of the treasure islands of the world, right? Which often get left behind, but we have the spectrum to be able to provide them that, that high speed reliable broadband access if we can just get an agreement with the city. Uh, so um, that's, a, that's a big challenge. The city has done uh, some good work in permit streamlining, right? To make sure that the permits continue to flow. So that's, that's great. Uh, but I think really it is about um, raising the urgency of this issue because the last thing we want is our city government to be exacerbating the digital divide by remaining an obstacle to what the supervisor said, which is getting this infrastructure built. Sometimes it feels like, you know, from my position that we're begging the city to invest and build. And uh, other cities are like, bring it. Like, how can we get ahead of the curve? And I think um, it, it, some of it is a little bit of corporate skepticism, right? Uh, and holding accountability. But uh, I, I think um, a lot of it is, is just building that layer of trust and partnership that I was talking about. So I'd like to add the importance of affordability, which <clears throat> for some of the folks that we serve, they simply can't afford to pay $40 a month. So having something that's 15, 10, $5 a month, even if it is not super fast, getting them something that, that they could engage in you know, some video chat with doctors or being able to do some research, like having an affordable option is necessary because you may have the internet, you may have all the internet anybody could ever want, but if they can't pay for it, then it's as if it doesn't exist. And if they don't have a device that works, there's no, there's no reason for them to pay for the internet. We were hosting a, an event for Comcast Internet Essentials many years ago, and a guy was like, I don't know why I'm here to sign up for the internet. I don't have a computer. And I was like, Right. So that's important. We need for folks to have devices um, and that there's lots of devices to be had out there. I know that the city has their virtual warehouse. Um, there's partnerships between the city and nonprofits to distribute and rehab those computers. So if there's anything more that we can think about beyond the internet infrastructure is getting it affordable, getting devices, and then supporting the nonprofits as they support their clients in engaging in digital literacy training or advancing their own skills somehow. So a lot of folks are asking for resources. Uh, so Cami, we'll start with you. Uh, you dropped a few into the chat, but any notable resources on how folks can get involved uh, post our event chat? Absolutely. So uh, you can always get our newsletter for Community Tech Network. Um, but the NDIA that I mentioned earlier, they have a free listserv. So if you're really like, this is your thing and you want to get like 10 more email a day, <laughs> not all of us fit that bill, but the, um, the NDIA list is really great. You have a collection of practitioners, researchers, policy people, infrastructure people, um, and then kind of, you know, other, other fo folks. So lots of interesting conversations. The one thing I find most valuable there is they're giving updates on the federal stimulus funding and what's happening and how we can follow closely along with that. So I would say NDA is a great first step. I've done a couple of webinars, one specifically connecting the unconnected. I'll dig up a link to that and share it in the chat. And that goes over, like, if you are working with someone, how do you help them sign up for the internet? How how do you help them? What are the basic skills they need to learn how to do online? So I'll, I'll get that and share it on the chat. Supervisor, where do you want people to go after this? How can they support you on your quest to connect SF? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so there's a couple of resources that the, the city has. Um, there is um, an interesting uh, kind of playbook that uh, the city's put together. If you, if you Google, um, uh, San Francisco Digital Equity Playbook. Um, it, it, there's a lot of resources in there, including organizations and others. 
it's really mostly geared towards uh, service providers. But at the same time, I, in preparation for this panel, spent some time perusing it. And I think it does have a lot uh, of, in terms of information about how uh, companies or individuals can be supportive. Um, we do have um, uh, some work that's being done within city government around human centered design that I'm really excited about. And uh, some of it is focused on di digital equity. We have um, Office of Civic in Innovation. We have folks who can be in residence in city government um, if you're interested in being involved at that level. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend that you also check out the Department of Technology and the Mayor's Office of Civic in Innovation uh, in addition to that playbook that I mentioned. Awesome, and Rudy, last uh, response. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you're interested in learning more about the kind of um, policy side of the digital divide, you know, I, I point you to uh, Verizon's white paper, the Accelerating America uh, plan that we put out on our website. You just Google Verizon Accelerating America. It talks about the three-legged stool of access, affordability, and adoption. Um, if you're looking for resources to get connected, right? Uh, so we talked about the emergency broadband benefit. Please, if you qualify, don't leave money on the table. Sign up for the EBB. It's temporary now, but hopefully Congress will uh, make a more permanent solution. Um, and I would say uh, back to policy, uh, in addition to Governor Newsom's uh, broadband uh, budget, the $6 billion, there's additional legislation going through the legislature right now to help clear some of the obstacles to infrastructure development. I'm talking about Senator Dodd's small cell bill, SB 556, Dr. Quirk's uh, permit streamlining and deemed approval bill, AB 537, Senator Gonzalez's bill on micro trenching, I forgot the Senate bill number, but to help streamline the process for getting the fiber built. Again, all of these are critical pieces of the puzzle along with the funding and the partnership that will help solve the digital divide. Perfect, May, to cap off today's conversation. Y'all are busy building our city, getting us connected. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you again to at and and Verizon for helping put together this conversation. I can't wait to see what we can do for 2022 and beyond. All right, thank you everyone for joining. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. Good to see you all. See you all soon.